Hello everyone and welcome to another video. My name is Matt and this is Code Journey. This is the first video of a brand new series named Pomodoro Flavors. Basically, we will be building a Pomodoro clock with three different implementations. One will be desktop application, another a web app, and finally a mobile application with similar functionalities. The main idea behind is a Pomodoro clock. A Pomodoro clock basically allows you to use the Pomodoro technique to get focus work done in short time spans. The idea would be to have a Pomodoro timer that will be 25 minutes so you can work on a task focus 100% on that for 25 minutes. Then you can take a short break of five minutes and then work again on another Pomodoro cycle of 25 minutes. Repeat once more so you have another short break and another Pomodoro timer and finally have a longer break of 15 15 minutes before you repeat the whole cycle. That is the idea behind uh, the Pomodoro technique and we will be implementing those into three applications. Today in the first video we will be building this implementation of the Pomodoro clock. This is a desktop application. You can see that we have the Pomodoro timer. It will start we can stop it, we can make it start again, we can take a short break and it will reset and start as five minutes. We can stop it, we can go to a long break and basically when it finishes, it will pop up a message that says your time is up and you should move to the next cycle. So if you're interested in learning how to build this, and most importantly, I will show you how to improve a first solution with good programming practices and code design, then you must watch this video. Let's get started. Before we jump into the code, a couple of things that you need to take into account. What you will need in order to be able to build this will be Visual Studio 2019, SDK.NET 5, that is the latest framework from Microsoft that they released a couple of weeks ago, if I'm not uh, wrong. Um, basically, it is like a merge, a combination of the two frameworks that were before. That one uh, was .NET 4.8 and the other one, brand new, was .NET Core. .NET Core 3.2, I think, was the latest. And basically, they merge both of those branches into one and only framework to rein them all. That is .NET 5. And you probably need to download that um, separately from Visual Studio 2019, but maybe the latest update bring it with it. I'm not completely sure. I will leave the links below because I installed them uh, separately. And if you are brand new to Visual Studio, I have a video on how to download, install and configure it. So you can take a look. Also, you will need to download the code from Pomodoro Flavors. That is a repo on my GitHub. And I also will leave you uh, below the link to another video where I explain everything you need to get started with Git and GitHub. So with that out of the way, all links in the description below, let's jump into the solution. If you download the repo from GitHub, you will see that it has two folders, one's one for a start project and one for result project. The result project is the one that I showed you at the start of the video. That is how we will end up building this. And the start project is a template that has basically the small components that we will be working with. I don't want to spend too much of your time showing you these details, but if you want, you can leave a comment below and I will explain it uh, from scratch how to build this form uh, in a brand new project. So basically we will have a Pomodoro form that is this, this one, pomodoro.cs, and you can see this one has code behind that is the designer, oops, that is the designer that has the code for all the design that we do on our form. And also it will have, if you uh, press F7, it will show you the code uh, that has the behavior behind our Win form. And if you double click on the on the form, it will take you back to the designer mode. And basically, you will have a toolbox that is uh, this this list of components that you can throw into the designer. So basically, if you want to add a button, you just drag and drop a button in here. You can do the same with a combo box and the same with a label. And that way, you just go and build your UI and put everything that you need together. And to modify the properties of each component, you go to this property properties tab down below and you can change the name, you can change the text, for example, testing, and you see that it changed in here. You can also, you can check after all the properties that you want. For example, you can change the back color and you see how you can start designing your UI. At the end of the video, we will make this base template into the other one that you saw that looks a little better if you ask me uh, but that is not the main focus of this video so we will start from this 
this base template so we can speed things up a little. And as I said before, the main idea of this Pomodoro clock is to have three buttons, one for Pomodoro that will be 25 minutes, one for short break that will be five minutes, and one for a long break that will be 15 minutes. All three of them will modify our variable that will be our timer on our program, and that timer will be reflected into these two labels. And then we will have two more actions that will be a start and a stop that will activate or deactivate our timer that in turn in each tick of the timer will update our variable. So basically that is our application, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And the idea, the challenge is to build all this functionality in less than 10 minutes. And I think I can do that while also explaining the details. And after that, we will polish our code as much as we can to show you how we can improve a design and uh, use all the programming practices that will make our code look, sh look much better and our solution scale if needed in the future and be readable and maintainable, even for a simple app as this one. So let's build it pretty fast, get our MVP done, show it, and then we can improve our code. Let's start our timer. So let's get started. The first thing that you need to understand is how this works in WinForms. So basically, each time a user clicks on a button, it will fire an event, and that event will call a function, a method that you define. So the way to do that is basically double clicking on a button, and then Visual Studio will make all the magic for us and give us this method that will be executed every time a user clicks on the button Pomodoro. The magic behind, I don't want to go much into details, but the, the thing that this is doing is creating a designer that has all the code for our WinForm. And if you look for the, the name of your, of your method, button Pomodoro click, you will see that it is doing this dot button Pomodoro, that is our button dot click and adds an event handler with the syntax that C Sharps handles events to a new system event handler that has the signature of our method. That will be this dot button Pomodoro click. So trust me, basically what it does is whenever the user clicks the button, then it will fire whatever code you put inside of this method. So what do we want to do when the user clicks on the Pomodoro button, right? What we want to do is update our variable that we said was our timer. We will call it time left. We still don't have that, but I will show you how you can create that automatically thanks to Visual Studio. So what we want to do is modify this variable time left and put in a value of 25 minutes, correct? So of course, Visual Studio will complain. And if you uh, press Alt and Enter or just click on this light bulb, it will show you how to solve this problem. Basically, the time left uh, variable doesn't exist. So you can generate a field time left and it will make it private by default. So we have our time left that is equals to 25. Then what we need to do is update the state on our UI. We want to show before we start the timer that the count starts at 25, right? So for that, we have two labels, one label for the minutes, and then we have to modify the property text. And in here, you should already realize that we have a problem, right? Because we have a label for the minutes and a label for the seconds, but we are only working with time left expressed in minutes, so something will not add up. But let's, let's keep writing and then uh, it will be more clear, I think. So basically what we want to do is this dot time left and make that a dot to a string and put the format of double zero so, so we make sure that no matter how many uh, minutes there are, it will always display as two numbers. So this will update the, the minutes and we can probably run this and I will show you. So if you run our program, you can click Pomodoro and it will update and show us 25. So that is working fine. But we need to also track the seconds, right? So we have another label for the seconds and we need to update that too. So 
we cannot do that and we could do a time left in minutes and a time left in seconds but then the complexity of maintaining that state is much higher the solution to this is to actually save the time left expressed as seconds so basically we just multiply the amount of minutes that we want on our pomodoro click that is 25 times 60 that is the amount of seconds in a minute and then our time left is is expressed as seconds and now we need to update our code so this will be time left divided by 60 and that will give us the minutes and to a string to format it and then to get the seconds what we need to do is use the module so what this will be doing is basically suppose we have 80 seconds remaining and then it will divide by 60 that will give us one and then the rest will be 20 so it will show if we have 80 seconds this will show us 120 okay so that's exactly what we want and we can give it a try and make sure everything works fine if we click pomodoro you will see 25 and of course because we still doesn't didn't start our timer uh, it won't go down so we don't see anything in the seconds so what we are missing now is we need to start our timer so it starts going down right and for that we have a control you see in here in our template we already have a timer one that is a control that is in here in the list you can look at it later and a timer has an interval and if you double click it it has only one event that is the tick so if you double click your timer it will create a method and an event as i showed you before that is the tick of the timer basically every time uh, a second happens or whichever interval you decide define this event will be fired so one second happens this fires one second happens this fires and so on and that's exactly what we want to model right so we have our timer with the tick and what we need to do is basically the time left minus one we can do that with minus minus syntax that is an operand to to subtract one from our time left and then what we need to do is update our state once again, right? So the way this will fire every time it ticks after the timer is started. If the timer never starts, then you will never get this event tick fire. So we need to start our timer in here, right? We can also do it on the, on the start button and we will actually do it uh, we can do it now but it, it will be necessary later so we can start in here but if we don't do this if we don't put the start at the end of the button pomodoro the experience of the user is a little bit annoying because you need to put the pomodoro on 25 and then start the timer right and you can clearly see that we have a problem in here because this is not a second right one two three this is going super fast and the reason why this is going super fast is because i didn't modify the interval of our timer so if you go to the timer and to the properties tab you will see that the interval says 100 and the interval in timers is expressed as milliseconds so a thousand milliseconds will be one second that is the timer that we want our ticks to happen right so we can save everything and run it again and if we click Pomodoro it will show 25 you can start it and then it will go down every second right so this is already working this is amazing um, what I said before is that we probably want to start the timer as soon as the user clicks the the button Pomodoro so that way the user does not have to click two buttons to get it started so you can check that now we have our pomodoro and i click it and it starts going down right away so this is great this is working you you could be tempted to not put this in here but if you don't do that and you just update after you uh, go down on your timer you can see what happens and the problem will be that you never get to see the 25 right it starts and it looks like frozen on zero and then already starts on 24.59 and that is not what we want we want to show the user that the countdown starts at 25 and then on the first tick it goes down so that's why we update the status before starting the timer so it has the initial state and then it goes down so this is working already pretty good for the pomodoro timer we need to also implement the stop button 
that is pretty straightforward just call the stop uh, method on the timer so basically this is like a handler that moves the the event from the button click to the timer and we can give it a try too and if we start the Pomodoro, let's say someone calls you, you get a notification that Matt tweeted something on Twitter and you want to take a look before continuing. Don't do that if you're working on something important. But something happens and you need to stop your timer. You can stop it and everything gets still. You move on, go do your task and then come back and you can start your Pomodoro back again and it is still working. So pretty good. We already have three buttons implemented. The next one will be fairly easy because we already put in the logic that we need to work with and it will be a short break. And what do we need to do for a short break? We need to update our variable timer and put it five minutes in it, update our labels on the screen, right? The same as, as we did before and start the timer. So if you think about it, it is this same logic, right? So we can basically copy this and put it in the short break and modify the 25 minutes to five minutes. And if we give it a try, we can start our short break and everything is working. Amazing. So we are missing the long break and we are missing something very important that I will do right after we finish the long break. So we double click the long break and copy once more our logic and put in 15 minutes. And then we have the three buttons already implemented. We can give it a try pretty fast. Pomodoro, it is working. We can stop it. We can start it again. We have our short break that starts at five minutes and we have our long break that starts at 15 minutes. We can stop, change it to another one and it starts automatically. We can stop and start it again. We can start it as many times as we, as we want and nothing happens. So seems to be working fine. We are missing something very important. What happens when this goes to zero? This should probably display an alert, right? And we have not coded that. So let's do that. When do you think that the logic should be for checking if the timer went to zero? It will be in here, right? So basically, if uh, if the time left, if the time left is equals to zero, then we don't want to update, but what we want to do is do a timer one dot stop. So we, we stop our timer so it doesn't keep going and firing events every second. And then we want to show a message box. So we will do it fairly easy. Message box dot show. And we will show a message that says your time is up. And we will put a title that says timer and stop it and else so if the timer did not did not finish oops if it didn't finish we will move our code up there and it will go down and update on the screen so to test this we will do some trick we will modify the short break from five minutes to one minute and so i don't have to make you wait one minute we will modify this from a thousand to a hundred so that way this will fire pretty fast and we can tap a short break this will take less than 10 seconds so let's wait a little and if everything went right there you go it goes down to zero and you get your message box that says your time is up you should click ok and move to your next task that will be a pomodoro one Okay, so this is our MVP. I don't have the timer in here. I will add it after on post-production, but I am pretty sure that we made it and this should be less than 10 minutes. Our MVP is working. We have our Pomodoro, our short break, our long break, of course, to make this work as expected. Uh, this will, this should say, whoops, this should say 1,000 1, milliseconds and we should modify this to five. Okay, so I will probably upload this to the repo too. So this, this will be like an intermediate version. I will put it as that. So if you want to check your code on, or if you are building this and you find a problem, you can check it out uh, and see what you are missing, right? But there are quite a few of problems with this. This works. I mean, you can ship this to the, to the final user and it will be a desktop application that is working. But we have a couple of problems. The first one is that our UI looks pretty bad, if you ask, if you ask me. And uh, we will revamp that at the very end of the video. But for me, the thing that is 
the worst about this is the cold. The cold behind this is not maintainable, or at least not easily, and looks pretty bad. It has quite a few of cold smells, and I will challenge you to stop the video right here and think of all the things that are wrong with this code. And now I will tell you <laughs> which, uh, which are for me and how I will reveal this and I will show you how to make this much, much better solution. So the first thing that should call your attention is this piece of code, right? We have this piece of code that you saw me copy and paste three times, right? So this piece of code is repeated in all of our method. And the only difference is this value, right? The amount of minutes is, is the only difference. Everything else is the same, so we are missing an abstraction in here for sure. We also have this piece of code repeated that is for the uh, update on the labels. And then we also have these magic numbers all over the place, like the 60. We can argue that most people should understand that those are the amount of seconds in a minute, but it is much better and more clear to have that expressed as a constant with a name so people can read your code as text, as English, and everyone will understand it. So basically, we have a lot of magic numbers in here as the zero, the breakpoint, the 25 for the Pomodoro, the short break, so on, and the 60 that is all over the place. The same with the formatting of this code. You can encapsulate it if you want. It's it's completely fine, and then we also have the this this form is like it has a little bit of too many responsibilities if you ask me because it is controlling the timer and also controlling all the updates on the UI. So a better way to do this would be to delegate the handling of the timer and the start, the stop, and the ticks and so on to another object and then make the UI only update and do the handling of the events. And that will be the last big refactor that we will do. But let's start with encapsulating and stop repeating so much logic in our program. Sounds good? Let's jump to it. In order to refactor, Visual Studio has a lot of functionalities that will help you out in this task. So for example, you can select a, a number, in this case the 60, and you can see the light bulb that appears that has quick actions, or you can also do it with the right click and go to quick actions, or with the shortcut that is control plus dot. So if we type control plus dot, it will show us this uh, this little context menu, and the first one is introduce constant. You can also extract method, convert to binary, and so on. So the one that we want to do is introduce constant, and when we click this one, it will create a private const int, and we have to provide a value. This will be usually a convention is to write the name of contents constants in caps, and I usually follow this convention, but you can uh, do it or not as you please. So basically, this one will be uh, seconds per minute, seconds in a minute, I don't know, uh, seconds per minute. I will put it like that. You can do whatever name you like. So this will be seconds per minute, and that is 60, correct? So now we can replace all these places, and I will actually do a massive replace because that will be faster. So I can replace 60 with seconds per minute. To open this, I just... Uh, use control plus F, that is to find, and then use this arrow, and that makes it to replace, and I will modify all the 60s, uh, modify them to seconds per minute, and then after that, I need to change this one, that is the constant. So if you pay the attention there, it says it modify 11 places. So of course, the amount of seconds in a minute will not change, because that is the way our world works. So that will be always 60. But if this was something else, some other magical number that is specific to your business and could be modified, imagine having that repeated 11 times, and then you have to modify it and go through all the places to modify that value. That is a big problem. And the thing that usually happens is that you go and modify most of the places and then you forget one or two and then your program fails and, and breaks production, for example. So to avoid that, we want to use this kind of patterns and avoid magical numbers repeated all over the place. 
The same for these other constants. We want to, uh, to actually give a name, an entity to these values because that 25 is the Pomodoro timer, right? So we want to introduce a constant in here that will be Pomodoro, oops, I already had caps on, Pomodoro timer or Pomodoro countdown or Pomodoro time, whatever you want. Pomodoro time, I think, is better. Yeah, that would be Pomodoro minutes to Pomodoro minutes. Sounds better. You you usually have to take your time and actually think of these names. I'm doing this on the fly, and that is not a good practice, but that is fine. So Pomodoro, oops, this is a good uh, a good thing that happened. I miss uh, I I put the wrong name in here. I forgot an O, and you can actually rename variables and constant and so on by just doing this right click on the selected name and use the rename and then whoops you can modify this and add the O that we were missing and apply and we have Pomodoro minutes in here so now our code looks a little bit better it is more clear so we have this dot time left will be Pomodoro minutes time seconds per minute so this will give us the time left expressed in seconds and then we have this formula to basically modify this but first let's finish with the constants so we want to encapsulate this five the same introduce a constant and put that as short break i forget that i have caps on short break minutes apply and then the same with the 15. so oops my bad i forget this shortcut sometimes and this one will be long break minutes correct so we have our four constants now up the top and then our code is a little bit more clear and avoids having any magic numbers all over the place so then the next thing that we want to do is encapsulate the uh, update on the labels on the ui right so we do extract method once again i just selected the lines and I click on the light bulb or right uh, right click and show refactors and then extract method is the refactor that i just did we provide a name this will be let's remove caps and that will be update timer on a screen let's call it that way update timer on a screen and that will basically do the time left divided by seconds per minute and then the module of seconds per minute and that will update our label so we can now go ahead and copy this and modify it every place that we have this same logic so now our code is looking much better you can compare let's let's compare this to how it was before right let's change this to 5 and 60 let me know in the comments below if you prefer this piece of code or this piece of code in here you have to read this the time left is equals to 5 times 60 and start thinking okay 5 is probably the amount of minutes and 60 is the amount of seconds in a minute so that makes sense but you have to do all that mental gymnastic to understand the code and then all this logic to do what label minutes dot text and then divide it by seconds okay so this is probably updating the label of the minutes and the label of the seconds so you have to do that extra step to understand what this code is doing instead of write out having the code be like reading itself in here it is pretty clear that you are updating the time left with the short break minutes times the seconds in a minute so you have your time left in seconds and then you have to update the timer on a screen and start your your new timer it is much more clear we could still do an extra step and encapsulate this into a method that says uh, get seconds in timer and pass the short break minutes as a constant i won't do that but you could do it if you prefer for me this is good enough this is pretty clear for this uh, for this app we can add uh, a break break line in, in there because that oh also we want to to move that back to how it was and change this one to update and add a break line in here because those these two are like coupled together it is the operation of updating your timer and reflecting it on the screen and then the other operation is starting your timer so i think that's pretty good our code is looking a little bit better we can also reorganize our methods to to make them group together as as needed and um, probably move these two up together too 
So now we have our support methods on, on the very bottom, right? That is the update on the timer. We have our constant at the top and all our events up in here. So this is looking much better. Let's move to the next refactor. Okay, so we have two more refactors to do. You can see that we still have the problem of the repetition of code in the three methods of the buttons, correct? We The code is looking better, we don't have the repeated code to update on the, on the screen, and we don't have magical numbers, but we still have the repetition of code in here that only varies on this value, right? That is the amount of minutes. So you can see that we are missing an abstraction in here, and let's create it. So we can select the the portion of the code, uh, use control dot and extract method. And we can call this method, this abstraction, start countdown, probably that's a good name. And we need to pass, of course, the corresponding amount of minutes. So this will be minutes to countdown. And then now our code looks much better, right? Because we have an abstraction that is our method that says start countdown. So it is pretty clear what it will do. And it will start a countdown for this amount of minutes. Pomodoro minutes is the 25 constant. Now what we need to do is call this method with the corresponding parameters in each event. So basically do that there. And we copy the last one and change the parameter, remove the lines that are not needed, and we can move the support method to the bottom. Okay, so now our code, our code looks much better, right? We have, if we go through, we have our constants, we have our private variable that is the time left, we have our constructor, and then the three main actions that are the Pomodoro click, the short break, and the long break, all they do is start a countdown with the, the specified amount of minutes. Then we have our button start, our button stop, and lastly we have the tick of the timer. That can be a little bit improved. If you take a look at this, you need to understand if this time left equals zero, then stop and else do that. It is a little not very expressive, right? It is actually telling you what it it is actually showing you how it does it rather than telling you what it does so this can be a method we can do a dot a control dot for refactor extract method and create an uh, a method that we can call is time up for example and basically what this does is check if the variable time left is equals to zero and returns a bool a boolean and now our code is a little bit more clear because it says if is time up, then stop the timer and show the, the message. Else, do that. That basically is make a tick and update the timer on a screen. We could modify, go a little bit further. We can encapsulate this one and say stop timer and do both things in one. And then we can also modify this to make a, a tick go down or something like that or tick uh, happen and, and encapsulate this. But for me, this is clear enough. Again, the amount of refactor that you do is up for discussion and, and you can go a, always a step further or leave it as it is. For me, this code is good enough. I think it is pretty clear what it does. All the methods have very little amount of lines because this application is pretty simple too, but we don't have code repetition. We don't have magical numbers all over the place. We have methods that are pretty expressive and tell you what they are doing. So I think this is a pretty good solution for me. And yeah, if we run it, once more, after doing all the refactors, you should always test that your application work. If you have automated tests, just run the test. If you don't, test it manually. So in here, we can click the Pomodoro and we see that it still works. We can stop it, we can restart it, and it is working. We can take a short break and we can take a long break or go back to a Pomodoro and everything seems to be working. So our refactor is good, our code is better, and everything works. So now our application works and the code is pretty clean, but we are still missing a big thing. Our form, our Pomodoro form, actually does 
two things at once. It has all the concerns related to the UI, all the buttons and the handling and showing a message box and so on. But it also is doing all the things related to the countdown, right? It is handling the timer, it is setting and having the constant for the times and the variable time left and so on. So you can see that our application has basically two things. One is the UI and one is the countdown manager or whatever you want to, to call it, right? It is the countdown logic. And currently, both of those things are embedded into our form. So we can actually do a refactoring here and create this abstraction of the countdown. So to do that, we should probably take a look first at what we are using and how we can create this abstraction and then create an interface that will be the contract of that countdown component and then create a class that implements that contract. So to create that, we need to understand what is the contract, what is the interface of that countdown component. So basically, we have the countdown component that we want to create, and we need to think which is the interface that the form will need to connect to it. A couple of things that we will need is first, of course, the set time, right? We will have a set time method that will be used by the three of, of the buttons in here. All three of them will use the set time method. Then we will have a start countdown start countdown and we will have a stop countdown i should probably write everything and then a stop countdown for these two buttons right but also we will need a couple extra things we will need to know when a tick happened and this will have an extra mark because this will be an event and i will later explain why we need that but basically the the form needs to know when a tick happens on the countdown in order to be able to show an alert when everything is finished and to update the, uh, the labels on each tick, correct? So our countdown will have the timer responsibility, the, the timer concern, and every time a tick happens, it will notify the web, it will notify the form that it needs to update its UI. And then, of course, in order to be able to update this UI, we will need to have the, the minutes that are left and the seconds that are left, right? And we can create an abstraction of is time up, as we said before, like the, the last method we created. Is time up will also be part of the interface and will help us uh, use it from the UI. So this will basically be the contract that our countdown needs to implement. Okay, so let's write that once we have the idea and the design on our on our head, on our brain, I would say, then we can create it. So basically we will do a right click on the project and go to the add menu and create a new item. Then in here we select the interface for Visual C Sharp items and the basically the convention for interface is to, is to start with a capital I and then the name that you want to your component to have the interface. In this case it will be countdown. So we will be, we will be creating a component countdown and we need an interface I countdown. So we create that interface. So in here we will create all the properties and methods that we want to expose. So basically minutes left that will be a get property only. Then also you can do this. Oops. Property. Uh, you can type prop and tab and it will create you with this template. And this one will be seconds left. And we can remove the set because we are not going to have that. And then one more. We will need a prop that will be a boolean, a bool, and that will be is time up. Okay, that's good. Then we need three methods, so let's write those signatures for the interface, and that will be public void set time with a parameter int minutes. This will be minutes to set. Then we will need a public void start countdown. Actually, the uh, 
Well, this is debatable. It could be a start countdown or just a start because the variable will probably be called countdown, but for me, it is fine as this. So just a start countdown, no parameters, and public void stop countdown. And again, nothing. Okay. And by the way, this is this is an important note. We want to keep this separated because we could we could as well put the parameter directly on the start countdown and avoid this method, but that will bring us troubles with the updating of the initial state on the UI. Remember that we usually put the initial timer, then show it on the UI, and then start the countdown. If we remove this set time, then we don't have that versatility to allow the consumer of this component to show the initial state before launching the countdown. So that's why we want to keep this these two actions separated. Okay, and the last element of our interface will be the event. So basically public event, event handler, and the name of our event in this case will be tick happened. So basically this will allow us to raise an event whenever a tick happens on our internal timer and then the consumer can do something every time that event is fired. Okay, so this is everything we need to implement in our countdown in order to separate those concerns and have our form on one side and our countdown component on the other and make them interact between each other to solve the same problem in a better way. Okay, the following step will be to create the implementation of this I countdown. So we go ahead, right click and add new item, pick a class and create a class that will be called countdown. Now we want this class to implement our I countdown interface. So now when we do that, it will show us an error and say that we are not implementing this interface and we can click on the light bulb and click implement interface and it will create all the template for this interface and we need to replace all these throw not implemented exceptions with the actual behavior. The first thing that we need in here will be to move some of the state from here. So basically we will want the constant of private per seconds, uh, seconds per minute, sorry, on the countdown that will be moved in here. So our form no longer has to, to keep track of that. Uh, the same with the private time left, that is our internal variable for the countdown. So those two will be in here. And we will also move the timer. If you remember, we have a timer in here in our form and we are no longer going to use that timer. The timer will be part of our countdown. So we can actually use a private timer in here and that will be another, another thing that will be used in our countdown. So we basically add the using of system timers and then we can have our variable with the timer inside of our countdown. Another thing that we need to do before start implementing everything is to actually create the timer, right? Because on the form, the timer was instantiated automatically by the code behind of the form. In here, in this component, in this class, we need to actually create that timer ourselves. And to do that, the best place will be the constructor. Each class has a constructor that is a very special method that only executes once when you do a new of that component. And for, to do that, basically, we will do a public countdown method that is uh, a name of the method that matches the name of the class and that will be the constructor. So in here we will do a this.timer equals new timer. Then we will do a this.timer and set whoops, the interval to 1000 and we can actually, uh, we, we could move this to another constant actually and call this and call this interval second one second maybe interval one second that's a good name I think and lastly we want to add the handling of the event elapse so basically the remember the event I saw uh, I told you we we were using in the form that was the tick 
Well, in here, in this timer, it is called elapse. So we want to basically, whoops, elapse plus equals. Okay, that's what I was trying to get. So basically, when you are trying to add a handler to an event, you can just type the plus equals to add a handler and then tap tab, and it will automatically create the signature of this method that will be shown to this event for you. That is basically a functionality of Visual Studio. And then we can say, yeah, timer.elapse is okay. And now we have everything we need to implement this contract and be done with it. So the first thing would be to complete the minutes left and second left and so on. So to do that, we can, there is actually two ways to do this. Let me copy the original way that I did it, that is with a property. So basically you can write the property as a get and return and so on, or you can actually use the, the syntax of the Lambda expressions for these properties and just return the time left divided by the seconds and, and that will work just as well. And I think it looks a little bit cleaner. So I will update the finalized project to, to reflect this. Um, for the seconds, we want to do the time left, whoops, time left and mod with seconds per minute. So we have our minutes and our seconds left. Then we will have our is time up and the idea in here will be to return this dot time left equals equals to zero. And we have another one implemented. And then we can move our event to the top. This shouldn't be in here. Actually to the very top, I think is the convention. Okay, that is looking better. And now we we can implement first the start, that will be easier. So this dot timer dot start and this dot timer dot stop. For the set time, all we need to do is set that time to the time left. So this dot time left equals two minutes to set times seconds per minute, that is our constant, right? We are missing only one thing, and that is the timer elapse, basically what happens when the timer ticks, and we need to raise our event of the tick happen to allow the form to use this event whenever it happens. So whenever the timer elapse uh, happens, what we want to do is do the this dot time left minus minus that will subtract one from it. And then we want to raise the event only if there is someone subscribed to that event. So basically, if someone did this, that is adding a handler to the firing of this event, then we want to invoke the event. Otherwise, we don't want to do that because nobody is listening, right? To do that, we can check with the question mark to check if someone is uh, binding to this event. And then we can invoke the event and pass the sender that is this, this object, and event args in case you need them. In this case, we don't need any event args, so we can just pass, pass event args empty, and that will sh do the trick for us. Uh, we have everything implemented, right? We define our contract. Are we missing something? Is time up set? Okay, that's an error because we don't need a set for is time up. There you go. When we define the contract, I forgot to 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 make the is time up only a get property, but that's fine. And now everything looks okay, and I countdown interface is fully implemented in our component. Countdown. So our component is pretty clear. It has only one concern that is handling the countdown. Now what we need to do is use, consume this countdown component from our form. So to do that, let's create a private variable in here that will be of type countdown. Uh, let's call it countdown. Oops. And we can instantiate this. We will. I, I will show you how to do this better in a bit. New countdown. Okay, that's fine for now. We will modify it later. And now everything should go through the countdown. So we will maintain our abstraction of the start countdown method because we will still do a couple things inside of here, but this method will change. Now we don't handle the time left and the minutes to countdown 
times the seconds. We don't care about that. All we need to do is the set time to the minutes to count down, to count down and then update the timer on a screen and start the timer. So to do that, we just do countdown dot start countdown. So now this is much more clear. We say to the countdown, set this time, then we update our timer on the screen, and then we say start the countdown, and we don't know how it happens. It could be a one-liner or 150 lines of code, and we don't actually care. We delegate that responsibility into the countdown component. And we can also change this, this logic that looked pretty bad before and change it to this dot countdown dot minutes left, which is a much better usage than having this logic in here, and this dot countdown seconds left, and just handle, and we can actually remove this parenthesis too, and just handle the interaction with the UI that is the formatting of this to a string. But we don't care about how it computes the minutes left and the second left. Again, another responsibility that is delegated into another component that is not our form. The same for the is time map. We no longer need this method in here. We can just remove it and actually call the countdown that has this logic. This dot countdown dot is time up. This is no longer a method, it's a property, so it looks a little better. And once more, we just need to call this dot stop countdown in here. And actually nothing, actually none of this is actually in here. We need to remove this because we no longer have the timer one dot tick. Remember, the timer of the tick is in the countdown and we will do that in a second. For the start, we just need to delegate this again into the start countdown and for the stop, the same, just remove it and stop countdown. Okay, so now we are missing only one thing, that is handling the event, right? So we want to do this dot countdown dot tick happen and then we want to add a method and handle the firing of this event. And what we want to do in here is the logic that we used to do before in here. In the timer is now the countdown tick happen. And what we want to do is ask if time is up, then stop the countdown and show the message, and else what we want in here is update on the screen. And now we can actually remove a, a part of this if-else, which will look a little better by doing just this. So now we update the timer when the tick happens. If the, tick is, if the countdown is time up, then we stop it and show the message. And if not, it will keep counting. Okay? So this, this code is looking much, much better now. We can move this handler once more to the bottom and remove this timer one ticker. And now we finally have a version that has everything clearly separated, right? We have one component that is our form that handles everything related to the UI and has our constants for the Pomodoro because that is part of the business logic and we have it in here. We could have another abstraction, but I, I think that's overkill and not necessary and I don't want this video to take a couple hours and then we have our countdown component that handles everything related to the countdown that has the timer that has the time left that has the constant for the difference of the seconds per minutes and so on and it provides a clear interface a clear contract for everyone that needs to consume this and this also helps us and allows us to do automated testing, unit testing, because we have an interface, a contract that we actually use, and then we can mock up a method or a whole object and so on and allow us to test these components if you want. We are not going to cover testing in this particular video, but keep in mind that this design is much more versatile, scalable, and so on, because the way we separated these concerns and created this interface on top. Okay, so now we have our refactor done. We should probably try to run our application and make sure that everything keeps working, right? So let's run it, and we will see that there is a problem, because when we try to do this, 
it will throw an exception that says cross thread operation not valid because we are trying to update our label from the countdown tick happen which is an event that has been raised from another thread that is because of the way this works in WinForms and it will happen you in other contexts of course and the way to solve this, the easy way to solve this actually will be to just invoke the creation of a new action in here so there are several ways to handle this cross thread thingy this is the easiest and I don't want to dive deep into this that is a topic for a different video for sure and we will cover threads and multi-threading someday so the syntax to do this is begin invoke and pass a new action um, then inside of the action we will pass a lambda expression having all this code right so we actually move this create a block of code and close the action and the beginning invoke so if I did everything right okay that's perfect so basically what we did is wrap up everything in a beginning invoke with a new action and that will solve the problem of this cross threading so if we give it a try now we should be able to create the Pomodoro and it will update just fine our labels okay and we can stop start we can do a short break and we can do a long break okay so just as a reminder this is our current implementation of the Pomodoro clock and this is what we want to design right I'm not an expert on design but I think this one looks a little bit uh, more modern or up-to-date and definitely uh, better colors and makes it pop a little versus this that is like basically gray and <laughs> control look like and doesn't convey anything right there is a lot of things that could be better in here our clock in here could use some styles uh, this could have some animations and there are a lot of things that can be improved but I, I needed to basically uh, define a scope and I prefer to put the focus on the code rather than on the design but of course it is important to have uh, a little bit of time spent in here because otherwise if you show this Pomodoro version nobody would even care because it looks awful and this one is a little better I think so let's let's show you how to to design this we can start by modifying the buttons in here so what we want to do is change uh, first the type that will be the flat style we want to change it from standard to flat and that will make the the buttons look flat which is a little bit uh, better in my opinion looks nicer and then we want to change the back color in this case i went for the indian red that i think look pretty okay and then we modify the four color for a white color and that will make it look a little better we can add a couple of points in here and add a bold and then make this a little bigger so that will look a little better okay and we have to do the same for the others I will try to make this with all of them but I don't know if it will work because there are some things that they are still fixing on .NET 5 so let's give it a shot actually and see if we can change all the colors of this to Indian red and it works okay perfect then we want to change the flat appearance oh the flat appearance does not work see it doesn't allow me to to change it looks like yeah okay that's fine uh, let's see if I can change the color of the four color to white okay same change and change also the font okay that's perfect so the last thing missing is we, we, we want to change all of this to flat we want to change all of them to flat once more and the last one okay so now our buttons look a little better right we also want to make this have the same spacing maybe a little bit like that that looks better and make this Pomodoro a little bigger because it is the most important one okay so now our buttons look a little better okay and for the background in here I just went for a gradient inactive action that is like a 
light blue or something and I think it makes it pop a little better than the previous one so if we run it already we can see that it looks a little better right we have this shadow on the flat buttons that looks nice um, and I like it a lot compared to what we had before but you can see that we are still not on our target right our target looks better because it is more modern more like visual studio or vs code that does not have this border at the top and that is a problem that is not quite easy to do currently oh uh, also i did a little different color in here for the start and stop but that's fine i mean we, we can change it but the main thing is to remove this top bar and, and have our title and the buttons like this. I think that looks better. You, you can leave it as in here if you prefer it, but for me this looks better. And the thing is to do that, it is not as easy and straightforward because we need to modify our form and make it lose the, the top side uh, bar, but then we need to maintain the functionality that comes with the window and then we have to do that functionality by ourselves. So it is a little bit hacky, but I will just show you in case you ever want to do this and, and you don't have to spend the time searching for it on the web. So the first thing would be to uh, click the form. So we go to the form. You just check that the properties say in here the name of your form. And then we want to modify the form border style from sizable to none. And when we do that, we lose the top bar from our um, form, right? And then we want to add a panel in here at the top, make it a little, a little like this and make it take all the top side, something like that, let's say, okay, something like this. So we have our panel in here, we will modify the background color of this panel from gradient to a nice red that will be a little darker than the Indian red. I will say fire brick, I think was the one that I picked. So now we have our top bar that is fake because it is a panel and we need to add the buttons and the label, right? So let's go for a label in here for our title and we can add it in there, remove the auto size so we can control it. The background color is fine and we want to change the four color to white. We want to change it to white and change the text to Pomodoro clock. Okay, so in here we will go for the book Antigua 18 bold and that will give us a pretty decent, a pretty decent title, okay? And lastly, we want to add our buttons for the close and the minimize. So let's go and find a button and then we will have to, tuck, to play with a couple of properties again. So first make it flat, then we want to expand on the flat appearance and change the border size to zero. And I, and I will show you why, why, because if we don't change that, what will happen is that you will see a border on the button and we don't want to show that because it looks awful for what we want this button to do. So change that to zero, modify the control text from black to white and change the text to an X. Basically, that will be for the close. Try with the book Antigua and maybe make it a little bigger. Okay, that's the one that I use on the final version. So that looks much, much better. We can save our designer. We can actually run it to see what happens and how it is looking. And this is already much better and pretty close to what we did before, right? We have all our buttons with the nice uh, hover over and we don't have the old uh, looking window, but actually our uh, our banner with the title and the button. And you can see that the button behaves as the other ones flat and it looks much better. But the problem is that this button doesn't do anything and we lose the ability to drag and drop because we no longer have the Windows control on the uh, top bar, right? So we need to implement that. But first, let's add the, the other button. So we can just copy it and paste it move it a little 
and change this to an underscore. And for this one, I just went and found another uh, another one that was more bold, so it will uh, it will be a little bit more highlight and more clear the button, right? So that that looks a little bit better. I think we can probably make this a little bigger. Yeah. Okay, that's better. Uh, what we need to do now is implement these ones. So for the, oh, the name is awful. Okay, see, I forgot to change the name of the button, so it says button1.click. We can remove this, and when you remove the the code or that resolves an event and you try to open your form, it will break. But if you click in here, it will take you to the binding of the event click to the method that I showed you before. So we can remove that and then we can open again our form and everything will work. Just in case you get into that error. So basically we want to modify this and click and change the name to button close and this one to button minimize. So now we can double click the button close and do this dot close. That is pretty straightforward. And um, for the other one, it's not that straightforward. I don't know if there are better ways to actually do that. I think I recall that I searched for it a couple years ago and I couldn't find a better way. So the way I do this is a little hacky, as I said before, but it works. So what I do is I change the form border style to the form border style, whoops, to the form border style dot uh, fixed single if I'm correct yes fixed single and then we minimize using the window state so this dot window state form window state dot minimize so basically we are changing dynamically the form border style and then using the minimize functionality that windows provide us it is a little hacky, but it works as well. It has a little animation that you can see for less than one second that it shows the border, but I think it is good enough for this application at least. And then the problem with this is that we'll, it will allow us to close and it will allow us to minimize. But then le le let's show you. Uh, I will show you what happens. So basically we can still, we cannot uh, drag and drop, but we can close and it works and we can minimize. And you saw that there was for a second this but then when we we activate the form again we have the top bar in there because we change the form border style to fix it single so in order to avoid this what we need to do is um, add a handler for the form activation so what we want to do is go to the properties uh, find our form that will be pomodoro form and go to events and in events we will have one that is activated that happens whenever the window activates or goes to the to the top and then we want to change once again the form border style to form border style dot none so basically this will hide it right so if we give it a try now we can see that we minimize it and then we maximize it and it shows uh, as before right there is one second in which you see the fixed single be before it goes to minimize but i don't think it is a big deal and, and it works and our form looks much better than having the full fixed single all day, right? So we are missing only one thing and that is the, the hack to make it allow us the drag and drop. The first thing we will need is to add a handler event for the mouse move on the panel because we want to have the drag and drop functionality on the top panel. So we select the panel, we go to events and we find the mouse down basically the mouse move sorry so we go to the mouse move and click it in here and it will create uh, an event and now we will need a property in here a variable that will be a point that is the last point where you found uh, where you start the drag and drop right so we will have a private point that is a class that has an x and a y coordinate and that will be our last point and then inside of the mouse move whoops sorry and then inside of the mouse move, I will paste these three lines. Basically what it will do is check that the mouse button was the left one, and then it will modify the properties left and top of our whole form based on the event arcs of the mouse minus the last point that was reported. And then we need to 
modify that last point whenever the user drops the drag and drop of the form, right? So to do that, we go again to the Pomodoro, this, oops, not designer. We go again to our form and look for the menu bar with the event mouse down, as I said before, wrongly. So we go to the mouse down and all we have to do is actually save the last point as the new point of the event arcs.x and the event arcs.y. And that's it. I mean, it is ugly, it is hacky, but it is these five or six lines of codes with two events, and that will allow us to have drag and drop from the panel instead of having the awful form we had before. So if you check now, we can drag and drop our form without any problem. You see that you have the full drag and drop functionality, we have the minimize, and we have the close. Again, all that last part was a little bit hacky and makes our code not as good as it was before, but it allows us to have this more modern-like UI on the Windows, uh, on a Win form. You can avoid this and have the standard Windows-like top bar if you want, but if you prefer to go an extra mile, I think this makes it look much better. And now we have our solution complete. And you can find this on the finalized version that will be the result project and good luck building this and tag me on twitter leave a comment below if you enjoy it and the next one in this series will be building a pomodoro clock for a web application using react thank you for watching and i will see you in the next video